you found the light version of the piece of persistence. For the full version of this episode, including a really interesting life story and an extended bio even for Michael Chadwick, please check us out at patreon.com slash piece of persistence. Hi, and welcome to the piece of persistence. I'm your host, Abigail Wright, and this is the show where we seek to uncover the keys to happiness and success one honest conversation at a time. I'm coming to you today from South Jersey with my good friend, Michael Chadwick, who I've known ever since I met him here as my student teacher for my high school choir. We've sung together professionally and we've known each other ever since and we've been good friends. Mike went from the music education industry into the interactive voice response industry and formed his own company doing that. From there, he moved to Dallas where he also formed a young artist opera company, which provided young opera singers with an opportunity and they were all in the Dallas region. He also stage directed opera as well as singing opera. He then moved to Manhattan where he actually reconnected with his longtime friend Suzanne, who he'd known since college and they were married. She is wonderful. He started working as a database administrator for an arts fundraising and marketing company in Brooklyn. And he was continuing to stage direct opera and sing opera and also he began to take photography more seriously whenever time would allow it. Now, when he pursued photography on a more persistent basis, this allowed him a lot of opportunities to make it more of a full-time business. So after Suzanne and Michael moved to Medford, New Jersey for their first home in 2012, a year later in 2013, he gave his full-time job notice and he started his photography business full-time. He hasn't looked back. And now at just over 40 years old, Mike feels like he's fully in control of his life and he's really reached the goals that so many people really reach for in their lives, which are success and happiness. And he really does believe that uh, happiness doesn't come easily and it doesn't always come quickly, but patience and persistence, surrounding yourself with the right people and believing in yourself are all keys to finding that happy place. Michael, thanks again for inviting us into your studio and for being here. It's really wonderful to connect with you again. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the moral of your story in your longer extended bio, um, that happiness doesn't always come easily and that it doesn't always come quickly. What does happiness mean for you? Again, that that's something that is different for everyone. For me, it's being in charge, being in control of my life. We recently met with financial advisors who asked me about what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, well, what is retirement? Yes. And he said, well, it's knowing, no one calling the shots and you being able to do what you want when you want. I said, okay, well, then I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and having that control over my life um, and the ability to use my time to create and to hopefully you know, do things for others that profoundly affect them in a positive way you know, with weddings or with whatever I'm doing, fills me with such fulfillment and satisfaction. And underneath all of that, having a support system with not only my family, who's always supported me almost to a fault, um, and letting me go off and do silly, stupid things that I probably shouldn't have done because they wanted me to explore and find what, it, you know, my direction would be. But also Suzanne, somebody who, she and her family have always been very supportive and kind and having that safety net under you is invaluable. So all of that combines together to create a happiness and thus for me, a success. Because now I have financial security that I'm in control over. I can work as hard as I want to and I actually benefit more when I work harder. A lot of people who work for others don't have that luxury, and it is a luxury. It is. It's true. I'd love to go back and explore the topic of control for you. Um, in particular, a lot of people will talk about studies about um, internal versus external locus of control, the internal being that you believe that you have some kind of influence over the outcomes and events in your life, the external local locus of control, those are the people who sort of believe that um, other circumstances are responsible for the outcomes and events in their life. It seems to me that you've had um, a bit of a shift in that thinking over your life, and I'd love to talk about that. Have you moved 
from a place where you were thinking that outside forces, that external locus of control um, had an impact on your life? And are you in a point now where you feel like you have control over the outcomes in your life? Absolutely. Going from that exter exterior control to an interior control contributes to my happiness more than almost anything else. Um, I would say that for me, because control is so important to me and knowing that I'm in control of my life and my destiny and my environment and not being able to say, oh, the consequence of failing out of school has cost me this. Um, being willing to give up too much of myself in a relationship has cost me this. Um, and the, those things no longer being out of my control, I can now for lack of a more genteel way to say it, exert my will over my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's critically important to me. Um, you know, I found myself in a situation back before I transferred to Westminster. You know, this was back in the, back in the 80s. I mean, this was a while ago. <laughs> but uh, very, very late 80s. Like, uh, anyway, but before I went to Westminster, I found myself sitting in Lake Charles, Louisiana, in a decrepit house that was falling apart, laying on the floor because I had no bed, laying next to a fan because I had no air conditioning and it was brutally hot in the Louisiana summer, going to give plasma, get plasma ferrises to give plasma twice a week just to get some money so I could buy bread and peanut butter to mm -hmm. survive. And I said, this is, I can't continue this way. There is no future this way. And so that's when I decided to transfer to Westminster. I said, you know, I'm, I had, started to sing. I was starting to really enjoy singing. And I said, well, let me give this a try. And my version of just, well, let me give this a try. was packing up everything I owned in my tiny little Geo Metro, driving all the way up to New Jersey where I'd never been in my life and just showed up and just, just, just see what I could make happen. Um, and when I got to Westminster, I had missed the registration letter that had been mailed to me. I didn't know I was supposed to have an ARIA. So in two days, I learned Arise You Subterranean Winds wow. and sang that in order to find the right voice studio. Um, and I just got to where I needed to be and then I just figured it out. So I would work in the MIDI lab during, during doing work study while I was also engraving sheet music on Finale for People. While I was also, it's, there's a statute of limitations that's probably expired on this so no one's going to get in trouble doing their sight reading Guido work for them on the computer and getting paid for that. Um, you know, and then going to wait tables until 11 o'clock at night and then, you know, just busting whatever rear end I had at the time to pay the bills that I needed to just to get by. And that's why when I failed and I couldn't go back, I had had four years of that and I just didn't have it in me. Yeah. And I would have had to pay $10,000 at the time out of pocket, which I just didn't have because that's just what they told me I had to do, and I believed them. So there were a lot of things, forces in my life that made me feel like I wasn't in control, and I didn't want it. I didn't want that to be my life. So when that first marriage thankfully ended, I said never again, and it was almost a. Not necessarily a revelation, but a decision to say, I'm not giving up who I am for anyone else ever again. And that's when you shifted the responsibility back on yourself. I wanted the responsibility. I wanted the opportunity to have the responsibility because, you know, I, they, they attribute this quotation to Einstein. I'm not sure if he's the one who actually said it, but, you know, the, the, uh, the, the definition of insanity is, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Yeah. Well, I had I let it on Pinterest. Yes. I mean, it's an, it's a really profound thought because if, if it's not working, why do you keep doing it? Um, and all of those things were not working. I had a, you know, my opera company was rebelling against my board was rebelling against me. You know, my marriage was suddenly ending, which that was not a bad thing. But it was a lot happening all at once in a place where I had repeatedly experienced failure. I said, you know what? It's time to go. Time to get out of Dallas. Time, Literally. Yeah. Time to go. And uh, that's when I went up to Opera North and when I had an opportunity to be myself and do what I do best and really 
show what I can do, I was given the, the, an award that in the history of the company had never been given to an, somebody who wasn't there as a singer. Mm. It was the first time a member of the production team had been given that award. Um, and they had, because I was there as a, an assistant stage director. So in the long run, it took me, it was a long path from selling my blood for peanut butter money. Yeah. And crunchy peanut butter, more protein than that, right? <laughs> um, from that place to having a career that gets me almost a six-figure income right now and enables me to support myself and my wife and our family and not be in a position where someone else can tell me what I can and can't do. There have been wedding clients even that I have fired because they weren't a good fit. I didn't like what they were bringing to the table. There was abusive or aggressive behavior and I said, I don't want your money. And I handed them thousand dollars. I don't want it. And having, and that's a big freedom. That's a place of power. Yeah. To be in a position where you can say, I don't need this. And you've won a bunch of awards from different places for your wedding photography business as well? Several awards from Wedding Wire and every single year from the Not I Win Best of Weddings. And what that is, is based on the customer reviews. And when we honeymooned in Disney back in 2008, we noticed what they did above and beyond expectation to make sure that we had a good experience. And I said, that's what I want to apply to my wedding photography. And so when you set Disney as a benchmark for customer service, obviously that's a pretty high bar. Yeah. Um, but subtle little things like coming into a wedding, knowing the names of the wedding party and the family members you're going to be interacting with. It's a small thing, but people appreciate it. They appreciate that I have a purse, a <laughs> man purse that I carry on me during, during weddings that has bobby pins, safety pins, knowing how to put a boutonniere on for someone, knowing how to bustle a dress when the maid of honor disappears. Uh, you know, knowing how many different types of bustles are and knowing in any given moment what to do to make sure everybody has what they need and can go back to having a good time. And they remember that extra care that I give them. And when they write their reviews, they talk about funny things like, yeah, he had a bobby pin. I couldn't believe it. He, he, had a, he knew the difference between a bobby pin and a hairpin. I, so do you want to tell us what your book is called and how to find it? It is specifically because artists most of the time do not make good business people and photographers are artists. It is a book called Balancing the Art and Business of Wedding Photography and it is available on Amazon or anybody you know who uh, is getting started as a wedding photographer and what it's designed to do is to give people that business foundation that they need in order to succeed because if people want to get into weddings and just think I'm gonna to go to a wedding and just snap a bunch of pictures go well, congratulations you just covered five percent of what you need to do. Uh, it's not only the photography, it's group dynamics, it's psychotherapy for the mother of the bride, it's you know, crowd control, it's, it's relating well to people, it's understanding the accounting. Why do you set your prices a certain way? What are the costs associated with fulfilling certain packages? What do you actually need to be able to earn from a wedding if you, don't, if you only shoot 15 or if you shoot 50 weddings a year like I do? So it's about the business end of it. And it's also to introduce them to many different types of weddings with which they may not be familiar. Mm -hmm. If they've never photographed a Korean Piebeck ceremony, for example, there is a whole section on what to expect, uh, what are the things that are going to happen. If they've never, if they've never been to a Catholic service, knowing that the, the kiss is not technically part of the rite of marriage or the nuptial mass. Mm -hmm. uh, and, to be, and to know you've got to talk to the priest. When is that going to happen? So. It's, it's giving them structures for different types of weddings that they're going to encounter and, and all the things they need to watch out for. Watch out for that topless woman in Central Park in the lake watching the wedding from behind the ceremony. <laughs> yeah, I had to Photoshop her out. So, you know, it's, it's learning all of the, the landmines that you might encounter along the way before you actually step on them. In addition to the business. In addition to the business. That's pretty great. What was it called again? Balancing the art and business of wedding photography. That's great. Do you have any habits or traits that you would attribute to your happiness and success? Persistence. Uh, we keep using that word. Obviously, there's a theme here. It's a good one. <laughs> um, belief. Uh, it's sort of um, 
a self-fulfilling prophecy is not the right word, but a, it's a snowball effect where when you achieve one thing that you, you didn't know you could, um, then you start to believe you can. And then just sort of like the running, I don't, I can't do seven, I can't do nine, I can't do twenty, I can't do twenty-one. Oh my gosh, I just did twenty-six. Yeah. Um, Somebody it, give me a nice bath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I build a nice bath that I can fit in. <laughs> Little victories over the years created a monster mm. where I really believe I can do almost anything, and I have an enabler at home that makes that problem even worse because she believes in me and believes I can do anything and tells me so. Um, and what a huge difference that makes in one's approach, believing that they can do it. So all of the successes that I've experienced have only built more successes and more opportunities for success. And now I, I, I just keep wanting to do more and try more and, and I can't get enough of it. That's fantastic. Do you have any other advice for us? I think the best way to say something that I believe, especially in this internet age where we have such access to each other, that be careful not to spend so much time minding other people's business that you let your own business go bankrupt. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, that's my deep thought for the day. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for for inviting me into your studio and spending time with me today. It's been so good to see you and spend time with you. Thank so you. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for joining us today on the piece of persistence. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, please take just a moment to share us with a friend or review us on iTunes or IMDB or YouTube or send a little comment. Every rating, every review, every share goes a really long way, as you know, in helping to spread the word about the piece of persistence and help new people discover our show at a time when I think really positive media deserves to be celebrated. So take a minute and do that. And also, if you know anybody who is incredibly happy and satisfied with their life and has had some success also in their life, if you think they'd be a good fit for the show, have them email us or you can email us and do an introduction at peaceofpersistence at gmail.com. That's peace like peace, not like piece of pie. Anyway, uh, thank you again. As always, don't forget to subscribe and join us next time for more great content on how to find the happiness and success in your life. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Piece of Persistence Light. Subscribe to our show at patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash piece of persistence for the extended version, where we also discuss the importance of focusing on the vast majority of things going right in our lives, Mike's surprising involvement in Deborah Voigt's The Little Black Dress Scandal, carrying each learned skill through life, what marathons teach you about life, and so much more. 